So welcome back. Here we are with uh, our chapter on environment sensor and sound notes, chapter 12. And we're going to look at the sound notes. There are two of them, sound and audio clip. So let's have at it here. Uh, sound is uh, the spatialization parameters for how uh, 3D sound gets uh, designed and orally rendered in the 3D scene. Audio clip is the separate node that just keeps track of the files and the starting and stopping of them so that audio clip works together with the sound node to go in there. So, uh, sound node. So here we are. Here are the parameters for the sound node. We want to specify the source that would come from the audio clip file. And then, of course, location and direction, but also the intensity and any spatial characteristics for the scene. So that source is provided by a separate node. And interestingly, you don't have to use an audio clip node, but if you have a movie that has an audio track that you want to utilize, you can also take advantage of that through the movie texture soundtrack. Just uh, referring to a movie texture note in the audio clip. Okay, now what's very cool about this is we can add multiple audio notes, uh, multiple sound notes to a scene and associate sound, different playbacks with different objects in the scene. And this can greatly increase the realism, uh, realism of the scene when it's, when it's done properly. Okay, so drilling down on these uh, different fields, uh, first of all, location. That's uh, where the sound is physically located in 3D space. As with other positions in X3D, it's uh, dependent on your parent transforms, dependent on the definition of the local coordinate system. transform nodes. Okay, and then uh, within that uh, location, within that local coordinate reference frame where all your parent translations and rotations have put it, as well as scale, um, uh, we then have du direction. And the way direction works is something we've seen once or twice before, not a four-tuple axis angle vector, but rather a uh, three-tuple XYZ vector for where is it pointing to, okay? And this, once again, is relative to the uh, local coordinate system. So since, uh, if you wonder, how does that work? Well, anytime you're in the global coordinate system, you know where X, Y, and Z are. Each time you rotate or translate that, you still have a local x, y, z. So your vector, three-tuple vector of direction is pointing from that origin along the x, the y, the z, or some combination of, of directions there. And usually uh, you would like to use a uh, unit value for direction, meaning uh, a magnitude would be equal to 1, the size of that cut. Okay, and then uh, intensity is an extra factor that lets us uh, readjust the overall intensity of sound. It'll play back with whatever intensity it was recorded at, uh, but then we can uh, reduce that, attenuate that by applying the intensity factor. So this is good uh, for I think best used for uh, relative attenuation of multiple sources. Okay, and uh, that way 
the user is probably adjusting their overall level. But if you have multiple sounds in there, one just seems louder with respect to the others, then it's time to use that intensity to adjust that relative to the others so that the user will control the overall volume, but you've balanced the sound among these different sound sources. Okay. And then priority, if you need it, you could, uh, if you say it's exceptionally important that this one be heard and the others are extra, well, you could give it a higher priority so that if a browser is having trouble keeping up on the current hardware of the user's machine with playing everything, if it can only handle one or two or three sound sources, perhaps, if there's a lot happening, that this will tell it which one to keep and which one to drop. Hopefully that would never need to get used uh, in a proper uh, output. Okay, and then what else do we have? Well, we have four different fields here. Uh, min and max front, min and max back. And what this is about is we're defining ellipsoids for the center of the sound where uh, the minimum distance from the center and then second ellipsoid at the maximum which has your attenuation down to zero. So we have full intensity in the center, zero intensity at the outside. We'll see this illustrated over the next couple of slides. These four parameters are how we define that ellipsoid. And it's, it's actually a, a, a quite terse, quite precise way of defining a, an ellipsoid. We'll see, we'll see in a minute that it's unambiguous mathematically. It does give us a, a, a unique ellipsoid when we pick those values. But uh, it lets us think in terms of where is my sound pointing to? Where would my user be who's listening to this stuff? How do I get it so the sound is pointing at them and they get the best effect? Yet when they move out of the way, they're over here, they're over there. Then interacting with something else, they don't want to keep hearing this annoying sound uh, because it's distracting now. It's over their shoulders. This lets you design the user experience so it's focused and keeps them looking at uh, and hearing just what is intended for hearing, hearing what matches what they're looking at. Okay, since uh, one ellipsoid is in front of the other, we also see that there are uh, some restrictions on here. Namely, keep the minimum less than or equal to the maximum, or else uh, you've inverted and it doesn't make sense anymore. Okay, so here's a diagram trying to illustrate this thing. And the way to look at this <laughs> diagram is uh, the big red to pink uh, ovals, ellipses on the bottom, that's the footprint of the sound node on the ground plane. And so you can sort of see that perspective-wise, we've tilted that over. And then the graph on the top that shows attenuation level, what you should do is take that attenuation level and conceptually consider that, uh, let's see, how do I best draw this? Why don't we say that this is the floor of that graph right there, that this would get applied right along here. Okay, so in other words, if we took this uh, graph of attenuation level and drew it in place in this ellipsoid, it would look something like this. There's our maximum attenuation level out to there, and then it linearly drops off to here. Okay, so I'm trying to show a 3D spatial concept with two 2D diagrams. And that's how they would get merged conceptually there. So if we just look at this simply then, we can say that we have the uh, maximum sound intensity inside the inner lips. And we have no sound on the outside. The maximum list. Okay, and then our attenuation goes from max to min, or in this case, it goes from the 
each case it goes from a value of 1.0 to 0 0.0 as you proceed from the inter from the inner uh, maximum range to the outer here's where I can't hear anything anymore range okay so um, a further way to conceptualize this is that the ellipse, that footprint on the ground plane there, where presumably the author, the user is, is not a 2D ellipse, but it's an ellipsoid. So you can think of it as being rotated about its uh, longitudinal axis. So it's sort of like an egg. It's an ellipsoid. It's a uh, rounded shape, a squished sphere that gives you both the inner bounds of where's the maximum volume and then the outer bounds of where is the volume no longer audible. Okay, uh, how, how little is zero? Well, in, in our case, uh, it's a 20 dB drop off, 20 decibels, and that's how we define it. Uh, sound intensity level is defined on a logarithmic scale, so that doesn't ever go to zero, it goes below audible threshold. Uh, so uh, this is the linearization, it's a very simple sound model, computationally, it's intended to be so that you could uh, implement it on a large number of computers with relative accuracy. Uh, do people really care if uh, how physically based this is, or you know, should it should it be uh, a more natural drop off? Would would this be uh, a more natural curve? Well, yeah, there are uh, better sound models, meaning better, higher quality, higher fidelity, uh, more physically based. That's all right. We're not trying to get all the way to that level. Uh, if you're if you're careful about how you pick your values, you could get a pretty good approximation first order approximation of these physically based models. The main thing to think about is, can I hear it where I want to hear it? And do I not hear it where I don't want to hear it? And so that's what this is all designed to do. Okay, so there's our diagram illustrating where min front and min back and then max front and max back together define the inner and outer ellipsoids that control the uh, audible volume for your sound. Okay, so that's uh, some of the layout. What's next? Spatialize tells the, the browser whether to pay attention to this from a 3D perspective. Most uh, PCs now have two speakers. And so spatializing the sound lets you have a larger uh, volume in one side, lesser volume in the other, so that you can give a better sense of presence uh, from that audible cue. And that's uh, particularly noticeable when you're navigating and going through. It can greatly enhance the, realis the uh, realism of the effect. So um, now where would this work? Since this model, okay, we can think that by the simplifications in this model, you don't see left ear and right ear anywhere in here. It, the position is where is the camera's position right now? So uh, I guess you could say your avatar has a pointy head very pointy. Uh, we're actually seeing a lot of pointy heads here on uh, Halloween, e even more than usual on Halloween. Today's uh, last day of October. Anyway, uh, that point source for where we're listening from can nevertheless be spatialized to left ear and right ear uh, from that point. And when that's turned on, then that tells the browser to do the extra work, do the math, to attenuate the signal going to the left ear and the right ear appropriately so that we uh, can get that more realistic stereo effect. Now, it's all well and good to say, uh, well, you know, spatialize it, turn it on, check the box. 
but how does it do it? How does it work? Other than well, if we look in the X3D spec, we'll see there's a, a formula there called the uh, pan factor. And panning, meaning if you're turning left or turning right, um, pan factor controls what is the intensity to either the left side or the right side. Okay, so we can see here how this is computed. It is based on a single point at the center, namely where is the user's viewpoint, which we've got a big eyeball here. I guess uh, in keeping with Halloween, this should be a, a, a hairy eyeball, right? Do we, do we put a, maybe a little uh, late night redness in there? Okay. And so, uh, in any case, it's centered at that crosshair underneath. It just looks better with the, the bloodshot, I think. Um, and so it's pointing out in some direction. So given that your viewpoint is somewhere in the world, and now given that we're listening to something, in other words, our sound node has to find a point location for that sound source, and a distribution over that. The diagram of, of a few slides back showed us how to get intensity. Now this diagram shows us how to modify that intensity to make it stronger for left or weaker for right or vice versa. And how does that work? Um, here it is. We compute uh, a pan factor, first of all, by saying, given this diagram, our uh, Pan factor overall is going to vary from 0 to 1, like that. 0 0.5, 1. Okay, and then given that pan factor value, uh, which is radial, uh, we, we then plug that into the formula here, and we'll get either our right side pan factor or our left side. So let's do a little quick check on these formulas to ensure that they make sense. If our pan factor is zero, then we should be hearing everything on the left ear and not on the right ear. And uh, boy, this is going to stress my, my uh, artistic skills, but maybe we can put a uh, nice big, uh, I guess we'd want hairy ears on either side of our Halloween hairy eyeball here. Uh, so for the left ear, pan factor is zero, we plug this in and we get zero, one minus zero equals one. Similarly, on the other side, with a pan factor of zero, one minus zero is one, squared is one, subtracted from one equals zero. Okay, so for this test case of left ear, we see that we'd have full intensity on the left ear, zero intensity on the right ear. That's if our pan factor were zero. Well, let's, let's plug in 0.5. If we do 0.5 each place, then we get, uh, I think you can quickly see by doing the algebra here, that you get the same value. You get 0.5 for each. Is that true? Well, let's check it out. We get uh, uh, 0.5 squared is 0.25, so I guess we don't get a symmetric. We get 1 minus 0.25 equals 0.75, and here we would get uh, 1 minus 0.25 is 0.75, and Gee, this is not working, is it? <laughs> Oops. No, it is. 1 minus uh, 0 0.5 is 0 0.5 squared is 0 0.25. Subtracted from 1 is 0.75. So yes, we do get equal attenuation to both left and right ears if the sound source is on a 0.5 or negative or opposite 0.5 uh, uh, 
uh, scale. So they're equal. They don't go down to 0.5. They go to 0.75. So we have a, just a slight attenuation. All right. And then let's take the most interesting case, uh, which is right here for uh, this guy, the one in the diagram. If our sound source is right here, then just for sake of argument, let's call that a, pack, a pan factor of 0.8. And then we get 1 minus 0.8 is 0.2. My goodness, we lost the hairy eyeball. Can't have that. Try again. We have a pan factor of 0.8. Okay, so 0.8 subtracted from 1 is 0.2 squared is 0.04. 1 minus that is um, 0.96. Let's do it over here now. On the left side, 0.8 squared is um, 0.64. Subtracted from 1 equals 0 0.36. 0 0.36 versus 0 0.96. Okay, so we would hear most of it in the, the left ear, excuse me, most of it in the right ear, and only a little bit of it in the left ear, about a third. Okay, so it looks like our formula works by checking it out. And, uh, Hairiness factor wasn't necessary. All right. So what's next? Uh, given that we can handle left-right intensity, and we've got a good approximation for that that's computationally tractable, then the next set of math is how do we figure out where these ellipsoids are? Gee, a, a front and a back value, either for the minimum ellipsoid or the maximum ellipsoid, Sounds a little bit under constrained. Sounds like it might be uh, insufficient uh, number of values to, to uniquely define a, an ellipsoid. So further, uh, uh, even if we believe that it works, how wide is that? Mm, the specification doesn't say. Okay, and so we uh, crunched through the math, crunched through the algebra here, and figured out a formula so that. Given two values, you can tell how big is your ellipsoid. Not just how long it is, that's pretty obvious from the front and the back, but how wide is that implied by that? Okay, so the next diagram shows us how did that get computed? How did it work? And, and we picked a, an example ellipsoid here. Um, you could use different values if you want. We picked these values, uh, values for uh, simplicity. Basically, a, a Pythagorean uh, triangle of uh, three, four, five, and then see how does this play out. Well, uh, our back is one and our front is nine. Okay, so let's see where those go on this diagram. If those are our defined values in the scene. then where would 1 and 9 be on this diagram? Well, uh, if we pick this focus as the center of our sound ellipse, then there's 1 meter this way for the back value, and then there's 9 meters this way as the front value. And how do we determine back to front? Well, it's based on direction. So here is our direction vector. So, um, okay, so that sets up our triangle set. Since uh, 1 and 9 is, uh, add up to 10, that would put the middle to be uh, uh, 5 right here. And so we see we do get C equals 5 minus 1 is, uh, assuming that is 0 right there, and that's C equals 4. 
and similarly um, C equals 4 on the other side by symmetry. And then we can use right triangles to compute our uh, B. And let's see if that's derivable from here. Well, um, how did we get to uh, A? We'll uh, quote unquote cheat just a little bit here. And let's check out the notes for this page. Aha! Uh -huh. The notes are remaining a secret. Probably don't need this on the video, Jeff. My uh, open office crashing. <laughs> See if it recover, recovers. This is uh, symptomatic of my machine problem since it dropped on Wednesday. Okay, here it is recovered. Okay, so if we look in the notes page, there is uh, a little bit more information and um, it illustrates the derivation. I have a lot of fun using uh, blank sheets of paper and uh, checking out an old geometry book and make sure we got this right, but uh, this is a good quote unquote exercise for the reader to confirm this uh, derivation of both the semi-major and the semi-minor axes. And actually, if you want to get a good reference for this, um, I think I can offer one right now. Let's pull it up. We'll go to Wikipedia and simply look up ellipse. And what I expect is, sure enough, you'll find uh, all of the information you might care for it here about ellipses and ellipsoids and semi-major and semi-minor and deriving it. And you may recall some of this stuff uh, from your high school geometry classes as well. So fun stuff. Okay, so back to the slides. Um, when you do work this out, then the distance from the focus to the lateral, um, there's, there are proofs that show that uh, that value A right there equals the semi-major axis. And therefore, since we know for our given example here that if C was 4 and A here was 5, then A here is 5 and we end up with a 3, 4, 5 right triangle. And so that means B equals 4. Okay, so that works uh, ever so nicely for this particular triangle. Let's look at it in general. And here's the math for it, uh, again, based on those derivations. And we get a really similar, a really simple pair of formulae, which is if you want to know how wide the half width is, then you take your minute, your back value and your front value, multiply them together, take the square root, 